Hi, and welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. My name is Deb Crow, and I will be your host. Join me on this journey as we meet heart centered leaders from all over the globe. Lots of interesting questions, interesting conversation, and find out what makes a leader. How do they handle uncertainty and complexity? How do they lead in a time that is volatile? Join us. Welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart Centered Leadership Podcast. I know that I say at the beginning of every episode that I'm excited to interview this guest, but I have to tell you, I am meeting the most amazing heart-centered leaders around the globe, and I have found another amazing woman. She is a lawyer in the state of Kentucky in the USA, and I'm so excited to interview her. I could probably spend the whole podcast just telling you about her and her bio, so I'm just going to give you some some key points. Her name is Lisa Lang. She has spent the last nine years providing counsel to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. She served as Assistant General Counsel for the Department of Education from 2008 to present and as General Counsel to the Education Professional Standards Board from 2016 until present. She also served in the office of the Attorney General as the Assistant Attorney General, Acting Executive Director of the Office of Civil and Environmental Law Division and Civil Litigation Branch Manager from 2008 to 2010. So Lisa Lang, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy to be with you today. Well, you know, it's another testament, Lisa, to social media and specifically the LinkedIn platform. I have met incredible leaders across the globe over the last, I don't even know how many years I've been on LinkedIn. And the podcast is eight weeks old at the end of this week. And again, I have found another heart-centered leader in you and I'm excited to interview you and uh, ask you some questions. So are you ready? I'm ready. So I have to ask the, of course, the most important question. And did you have aspirations as a young girl to be a lawyer or how did the interest in law come about in your life? So I would say that it was probably the very first thing that I wanted to do, but it was not the thing that I always thought I was going to be able to do. So um, my path took some slight deviations um, until I kind of came back to center and um, began um, in earnest my pursuit of uh, my dream of being a lawyer. Well, and I've worked myself with many plaintiff and defense lawyers. I used to be a community-based case manager. And I know that you are also a dedicated, seasoned professional. And I think that you pride yourself with how you kind of mitigate and navigate through complex matters. So my next question is, what imperfections do you feel have really contributed to your heart-centered leadership as a lawyer? Well, you know, I really think that um, I've learned more in my life from the, the, my missteps and things that, you know, I, I might have perceived as one time as um, failures or um, failure to um, achieve what um, I had set out to achieve. So um, I've, I've learned a lot more from that than any success that I've ever had. Well, and I love how you frame that, the missteps, because we can certainly have an intent to do something and and want it to unfold the way we set up the goal, but that's not always our effort and the way we want it to develop. So interesting way of framing. I really, really like that. Who in the legal world has been a real mentor for you, Lisa, and why? You know, I have been so very lucky, and I don't know why it is, but I feel like at every phase of my uh, 
career, there has been somebody along the way that has really taken the time and interest in um, working with me and helping me to develop and to figure out what I wanted my next step to be. Well, and I think mentorship is so important, just the fostering and, and leadership skills. Do you find in your career thus far and what you've noticed in your own legal practice and career and working with others, do you find sometimes with the technical skills that come with learning law, have you ever had exposure or worked with someone who would be coined as an accidental leader? Have I ever worked with somebody um, who would be an accidental leader? I would say absolutely every day, all day. Um, I think that I've been fortunate enough um, in that I've worked on teams where um, I think the, think the important thing about a team is when you put a team together, you have somebody who has been specifically designated as the leader, but the people that make up the team have different skill sets. And there are skills of those people on my team that um, I don't have. And um, there are times when there are people on my team who have uh, areas of strength that are not my areas of strength. And um, they have uh, taken, taken charge um, when necessary and handled things when I was either not present um, or um, in some situations um, where the situation called for them to take the lead. Well, and I love talking about accidental leaders because they have those core leadership skills, which you possess in heart-centered leadership and the virtue of patience and empathy and compassion. And why do you think sometimes it's difficult for people to exercise core leadership skills, especially if they've got a high academic career and they've gone to school, maybe at an Ivy League school, et cetera. Why do you think sometimes the technical skills can be so present, yet it's difficult to exercise the core leadership skills, otherwise known as emotional intelligence? Yeah, we've, there's been a lot of conversation of surrounding this very issue um, on LinkedIn and um, discussions relating to uh, the, the preparation that you get from um, going to law school. And I think that um, that's not something that is focused on. What you learn when you go to law school is you learn how to develop those technical skills, but a lot of those other skills, um, such as emotional intelligence, those are not necessarily ones that are specifically taught. Those are skills that you have to develop over time. And I think it's hard to develop those if you're not paired with or in environments um, that are conducive um, for that kind of development. And I think for me, the benefit that I had is that I started my career in the military and I started as a paralegal and I spent six years. And part of that training is not just learning the technical skills related to the field that you were, you enlisted to perform, but you also learn about leadership. Um, in order to be promoted from a specialist to a sergeant, I needed to go to a primary leadership development course. And then in order to um, be promoted from a sergeant to a staff sergeant, I had to go to a basic non-commissioned officers course. And I credit those types of courses in helping me to learn some of those skills. Um, and then when um, I was deployed for um, almost an entire year, uh, when I was stationed in Germany, my husband um, was at home with our two children, my um, six month old and my 18 month old. And I was deployed for almost 11 months. And I feel that um, that deployment really did help me develop some leadership skills because it took what I learned in PLDC. I hadn't gone to BNOC yet but um, PLDC and it helped me to try and put them into action and, and into place. And I also observed other leaders in action 
And, um, you know, you learn as much from um, a poor leader as you do from uh, a, a leader that is good. And, and I had, um, I was fortunate in that I had a, a variety of leaders that I feel like I was able to learn a lot. And um, so I feel like I have an experience that not a lot of, of other lawyers have had the opportunity to experience. Well, and what a trajectory you've had from the military to paralegal to becoming a lawyer. And I can't even imagine all of the stories and, and things that you've learned along the way. Is there one specific memory from any part of that, I'm going to say timeline or trajectory that really stands out for you, Lisa, that you feel has greatly impacted how you lead today? Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's so many different things that I have experienced that has taught me um, all sorts of different things. Um, the one thing um, that I did learn quickly um, when we were deployed in Bosnia is a leader must be decisive because um, if you are not decisive, I think that be, not being decisive is, is a bigger problem sometimes than making a decision and then following it through. It's changing your mind in the middle of it that is a problem. And um, I recall um, when we were in Bosnia, um, we were set up in tents and um, we would have to go to the main, uh, Tuzla Main once a week for showers. And um, we were, our tents were on a, a strip, a runway. And um, at, in Bosnia, part of the problem was that they had a lot of IUDs and unexploded ordinances that were um, in the, the areas where there was no pavement. So you had to be really, really careful when you were traveling. And um, so our, um, our top or our technical op or our tactical operations center was on one side of this airstrip in our tents where our um, personal hygiene items were on the other side. And in order to get from the top to the tent, you had to go down along an access road that was right next to the airstrip. And so we went from the top, we got on the access road, we drove, it took about 10, 15 minutes for us to, to go from the top to our tents. And um, we had Humvees and we had to travel in three Humvees. And um, these access roads were very, very narrow. And these Humvees were very large. And we needed to be careful not to go onto uh, anything that was not paved because we did not know whether it had been cleared of ordinances. So we traveled down to our tents. We went in, we got our stuff. We got back into our Humvees and we started coming back towards the top. And so we were traveling down the very same access road that we had traveled down 15 minutes beforehand. And we got about halfway um, down the road and there was some concertina wire. It was a bale, um, big bale where it's, um, it's, it's wrapped up and it was pulled like a slinky across, across the um, access road and we could not move forward without either going backward or um, going and pulling that uh, concertina wire back off the road. And so um, I remember distinctly our, our um, company commander was with us and um, she got out of the vehicle. She had us all get out and um, we pulled like security on either side of the vehicle. She had to make a split second decision. Does she have somebody go and pull that concertina wire back and risk it being um, booby trapped and um, there being, you know, some kind of bomb or something attached to it, or do we just go backward? And uh, I'm telling you, trying to, not everybody um, in the military when you're in a, a, a support unit knows how to drive a Humvee very well going forward, much less backward. Um, and so the three, we had these three vehicles and she made the split decision for us to all get back in our vehicles and to go in the three vehicles to go in reverse, um, to go back and then she called it in um, to have um, the bomb squad come in and determine whether or not it was booby trapped. So to me, I mean, that leadership, it was, she had to get out, she couldn't be afraid. She had to show leadership, 
She had to, you know, be present of mind to make sure that everybody knew what they needed to do while she made a decision. Then she made a decision and she followed through on that decision. And um, that I remember being very, very impressed with that decision making process. And as it turned out, um, the concertina wire had not been booby trapped. We suspect that some kids probably were just messing around and um, pulled it across the road. But her rationale later, she explained was that she felt that um, it was a safer thing to go backward because they had less time to do something behind us and that they had more time to do things in front of us. And so, you know, whether or not, I don't know militarily if that was the right decision, but in, um, I was very impressed with it. And um, I, that's, that's something I've remembered to, to this day. And, and I've always strived to be that cool under pressure like she was. And I really, and given who she was, I never thought that she would perform that way um, under, under pressure like that. I've seen other people who would collapse and crumble, which I didn't expect. And then um, I never expected her to stand up and, um, and, and show that kind of leadership um, when the chips were down and she did. And I just remember thinking that's, that's who I want to be. What a phenomenal story, Lisa, and just listening to your, po your passion and your emotion in, in explaining it. And I'm sure it, just as you're talking, I'm, I, I feel like you, you put yourself right back there. It was just such an emotionally told story. So thank you for sharing that. What a life you have lived, Lisa. <laughs> Now, I have to ask about RBG because I know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg is, is the mentor for many. What impact uh, did she have during your education or has she had since you've been practicing? Oh, I, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she is um, someone that... Um, I admire very much. Uh, my daughter is a lawyer and um, my mom is not a lawyer, but she has always um, loved the legal profession. And um, yeah, she, she is phenomenal. And I remember going to see um, the movie with my mom um, and that was such an amazing movie. And to think about all that she did um, to help and support her husband and her family and then um, to be able to accomplish what she did and still be able to do those things and for her to continue to do what she's doing um, despite all the health challenges she had is, is really amazing and inspiring. Oh, I agree. And I, I, think, uh, I think she loves being called RBG. And I just, I, I bow at the depths of her tenacity and grit. And like you said, just all of her personal struggles, but it just goes to show with mindset and heart-centered leadership, anything can unfold. Absolutely. She is amazing. I hope I'm that spry when I'm her age. Oh, you and me both. She is, tr she's truly amazing. Well, yeah. I like to end the podcast with what I call the fab four. Okay. And these are just four fun questions. The answers are whatever's just kind of sitting right on the top of Lisa's mind. It's, it's those no think questions. Okay. If I were to speak to your family or your friends or a coworker, and I asked them to describe Lisa in one word, what word would they give me? Dedicated. See, it was sitting right there. You didn't even yeah. have to think, right? Yeah, I would, they probably say workaholic, but I like to <laughs> dedicated is, 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 a, is a kinder, gentler term. There you go. If I gave you a time capsule and asked you to put an item or items in it to represent 2020 before you bury it, what would you put inside? Well, I would definitely put in my uh, handy dandy branded hand sanitizer um, that I got from um, my, uh, my employer with their brand name on it. So that's very nice. Um, I would probably put a COVID-19 mask. And then I think I would probably put in the program 
um, the, the wedding announcement, my daughter, um, she got married right before COVID-19 in um, March. She's in Texas right now, and um, I'm so glad she got married in February. Um, so I'm so glad we were able to do that. And then I think I would probably put something in there um, for my first grandchild that was born on um, May 29th. Well, even though it's been COVID-19, you've had lots of wonderful family events and you're a grandma. So what a wonderful, yep. what a wonderful list of things to put in and congratulations. Thank you very much. So I, you must have a bucket list. Tell me what is on the top of the bucket list that Lisa wants to do next. Career-wise or personally? You can give me both. Okay, well, I would say personally, what I would like to do is um, I would like to um, travel um, to a foreign country after um, this COVID-19 thing is over. So I would, I would really like to be able to take a week and do something like that um, with my family, go out of the country. Um, and then as far as my career goes, um, I feel that we have made tremendous progress where I work right now. Um, and um, I would like to be able to stay there long enough to see um, us be able to um, accomplish some of the things that um, we have been working on, bringing um, the university to a, a stronger um, position and um, to maybe set up a program, um, a preload program um, for students um, to put them on a good path towards um, um, a career in the law. Well, that's lovely. And, and I, in, in what I said at the beginning, I, I could have talked about you and your background for the whole podcast. So there's no doubt in my mind, Lisa, that you're going to achieve that. I am a big proponent of self-care and the importance of it. And my last question, Lisa, is what self-care activity do you pride yourself on and is part of your daily regime? Um, so, you know, I don't think I have any one thing, but um, I have really recently begun to understand the importance of having um, a good rest ethic that is as good as your work ethic. And so part of that means that you need to find something that um, allows you to disengage um, and, and to turn your brain off. Um, and what I would say the last uh, self-care activity I did last weekend was um, I tore down my rotting porch. Well, I don't know if I if I call that self care or mandatory and, home renovations. <laughs> so. Yeah, but here's why I call it self care. And the problem I have sometimes because of my dedication is I have a hard time clearing my mind. And what was nice when I would when I tore down that porch was for we did it for three hours. And I did it three days, two hours each day. And the nice thing about it was it was a time when I could. Um, it was like problem solving, like you do a puzzle um, and um, exercise, which is great. And I didn't think at all about any work or um, any, any problems that I'm trying to solve professionally. So it, it does sound crazy, but it was, it was exercise, it was problem solving, and it was the ability to turn your brain off and, and not think about work. No, oh, it's it's a great strategy, and I'm I, I'm I'm laughing along with you because it's kind of like ripping out kitchens, and and someone gets a sledgehammer, and yeah. it's it's just a different exertion of our energy, and it absolutely can be self care because you probably had a lot of laughter and a lot of fun doing it. Sure did, <laughs> yeah, and that sledgehammer is a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good, good, good stress reliever, right? Oh, it is. Absolutely. You should try it. Well, Lisa, you are as delightful as I knew you would be. And I know you're busy, so I appreciate you spending time with me. I loved hearing about your story. I look forward to uh, continuing uh, our connection and future chats and wish you all, all the best in the future. Thank you so much.
I like to end the podcast with my favorite five things, and that is to follow your heart, have passion, do your best, know your truth, and always be in love with the journey. This is Deb Crow. Thank you for joining me once again on Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast.